Hi, and welcome to Lesson 7 here in our Compounds Unit. Here in Lesson 7, we're going to talk about how to figure out the names and formula of covalent compounds. Lessons 5 and 6 dealt with ionic compounds, and if you haven't watched those yet, you really should before we go through this lesson. Our example covalent compound here is nitrogen 3 oxide, or dinitrogen trioxide, also known as N2O3. Let's go in and talk about how this was figured out. Remember that when we name and formulate compounds, they have to follow specific rules. Those rules are established by IUPAC, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, whose logo also happens to be the next tattoo I want to get. You absolutely need to be able to use these rules in order to write compound formulas and names. Let's go in and take a look. Binary covalent compounds are compounds that are made out of two non-metals. That's what makes them covalent. It does not have to be the simplest whole number ratio, so that's different from our ionic compounds. The sum of the oxidation states of the elements in the compound does have to add up to zero. We're going to put the less electronegative atom first. We're then going to follow that by the more electronegative atom. We're going to use subscripts, just like we did with ionics, in order to show the number of atoms in each compound. And we're never going to use the subscript one. It's absolutely just assumed to be there. Let's talk about this notion of oxidation states. An oxidation state is a theoretical rule that we can use in order to track electron ownership in a covalent compound. Remember that in a covalent bond, the electrons are being shared by all atoms. At the same time, we need to have a way to figure out which atom brought which electrons to the party. Oxidation states help us to do that. It's different from ionic charge because ionic charge is actually a real thing, right? Ions have real charges. In a covalent compound, Atoms are assigned oxidation states, but they don't actually really have anything in reality that equates to that oxidation state. Even though that's the case, oxidation states and charges are very, very similar. For instance, an atom that does have an ionic charge has an oxidation state that's equal to that ionic charge. To keep them separate, we write them slightly differently. So we write oxidation states with the sign and then the number instead of the number and then the sign like we've been doing for ionic charges. You don't need to worry about that. That's really for fancy chemists to keep track of. If you want to not pay attention to which one you write first, that's totally fine. If you want to be a fancy chemist and try to keep track, go right ahead. But all I care about whenever you're dealing with ionic charges or oxidation states is just that you have a magnitude, a number, and a sign. As long as you have a sign and a number, or a number and a sign, I'm totally cool. Of course, if you're watching this and you're not my student, mileage may vary. When we want to name binary covalent compounds, there are two methods that we can use. The first is to use the stock system. We can totally use the stock system for naming binary covalent compounds. In that case, remember that the more electronegative atom, the one that comes second, will have the oxidation state that's listed at the top. And the less electronegative atom we'd have to figure out, and then we can assign its value in its stock system name. Another way to do covalent compounds, and only works for covalent compounds, is to use the prefix system. In the prefix system, the number of each atom in the compound is indicated with a prefix. If it's one, we'd go mono, two would be di, three would be tri, four would be tetra, five would be penta, six would be hexa. You could probably figure out the rest of them if you absolutely need to, but you'll never really see it with more than four or five atoms. The thing that's weird about the prefix system is that we generally do not use the mono prefix if it applies to the first element in the compound. You'll see this when we go through our examples. If you want to use the mono prefix, you can. It's an acceptable name according to the rules. It's just not a name that you will commonly see. Let's try naming some covalent compounds. Determine the names, both the prefix name and the stock name, for each of the following compounds. So here are the compounds. Pause the video and try it on your own, and then when you're ready, we can go through it together. So the first thing I'm going to do is the prefix name. Remember that we're going to use a prefix to indicate the number of the atom in the compound. So for NO2, it would be nitrogen dioxide, one nitrogen and two oxygens. Now, if you called it mononitrogen dioxide, you would not be wrong. It's just that you'll never see anyone use that mono prefix anytime when there's one atom at the beginning of the compound. H2S is going to be dihydrogen sulfide, and CF4 is going to be carbon tetrafluoride. Do these make sense? Let's go and look at stock versions. In order to figure out stock versions, I'm going to need to figure out the oxidation states of the atoms in the compound. In NO2, nitrogen is plus 4 and oxygen is minus 2. In H2S, hydrogen is plus 1 and S is minus 2. And in CF4, C is plus 4 and F is minus 1. Now that I know those oxidation states, I can figure out their stock names. 
The stock name for nitrogen dioxide is nitrogen four oxide because nitrogen is plus four. In H2S, we have hydrogen sulfide. We don't need to use the stock system because hydrogen is always plus one. And carbon tetrafluoride will be carbon four fluoride because carbon is plus four. Do these make sense? If they don't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have before we move on. Let's also do some formulas while we're here. Figure out the formula of each of the following compounds. I've mixed up prefix and stock versions. Pause the video, try it on your own, and then when you're ready, we'll go through it together. So let's figure out the oxidation states first in the compounds. We know that carbon two oxide is made out of carbon with a plus two oxidation state and oxygen with a minus two oxidation state. We know that in phosphorus trichloride, phosphorus is plus three and chlorine is minus one. And we know that in dihydrogen monoxide, hydrogen is plus one and oxygen is minus two. Now that we know those, we can figure out the formulas. The formula for carbon two oxide is CO. Its other name would be carbon monoxide, which you're probably more familiar with. The formula for phosphorus trichloride is PCl3. And the formula for dihydrogen monoxide is H2O. Of course, nobody really ever calls it that. We just call it water. Did these make sense? If they don't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have before we wrap up. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of naming and formulating binary covalent compounds. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can name and formulate binary covalent compounds according to the IUPAC rules. Also make sure that you can use both the stock system and the prefix system for binary covalent compounds. And finally, make sure that you can determine valid and invalid names and formula for binary covalent compounds. If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have. You can always leave them for me in the comments below the video or get in touch with me through the information in the info field. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.